aided in reducing the levels of loose contamination. Smear samplings monitored the effectiveness of decontamination at every step. Surveys made after each general cleaning determined the next course of action. The site grounds were scraped twice. Loose contaminated dirt was hauled to the burial ground. No heavy duty equipment and vehicles were permitted to leave the contaminated zones before being steam cleaned. Next, a meticulous health physics survey revealed the remaining difficult and localized hot spots. These were removed with a shovel. Temporary roads, constructed to facilitate the recovery operations, were rolled up toward the burial ground, thus leaving a clean area behind and concentrating the remaining contamination in an ever-decreasing area until the last radioactive debris was contained. Personnel leaving the restricted contaminated zones shared their anti-contamination clothing in a trailer adjacent to the control point. They underwent complete monitoring inside a steel cubicle. Its purpose was to minimize residual background radiation from the surrounding area. No significant body contamination occurred during the recovery. Health physicists carefully recorded the name, time, and exposure for each personnel entry. Only 3% of the exposures exceeded the established limits of 3 rems per quarter whole body or 10 rems per quarter skin dose. The highest whole body exposure was 3.21 rems. Whole body counting sampled the effectiveness of face masks in preventing the inhalation of contaminated aerosol. In no case was there observed any whole body burdens above 10% of the recommended guide values. The badge belt was devised for obtaining a representative dose for the highly erratic and short-range beta radiation. It was recognized early in phase three that the skin dose, beta plus gamma, would be the limiting criterion for personnel exposures. Thus, the beta exposure was computed from the average beta to gamma ratio determined from the 18 badges around the waist. In general, the ratio varied from uh, 4.5 during the cleanup entries down to uh, 1.0 during the final stages of gravel removal. Whole body exposures during phase three were accumulated rapidly during the initial cleanup activity. As the project drew to an end, the exposure rate diminished to result in an overall expenditure of 1140 rems whole body. The average exposure per active participant was 2.6 rems for the entire 13 months of phase three. The same is generally true of the accumulated skin dose profile. The total of all exposures for all personnel during phase three was 3,850 rems skin dose. The recovery program beginning January 3rd, 1961, lasted 18 months. The whole body exposure data showed a high rate of biweekly expenditure during the phase one emergency period. This was followed by a relatively low rate during the four months of phase two when no entries were allowed into the reactor building. This rate then increased for the phase three effort, during which the building was being dismantled and decontaminated. Gradual reduction in the rate followed as decontamination efforts took effect. A total of 1,240 persons participated in the recovery effort, of whom 790 were working in radiation fields at the SL-1 site. Most of them were affiliated with Combustion Engineering, H.K. Ferguson Company, General Electric Company, AEC, and the U.S. Army. ...was providing initiative. Control rod racks, nuts, steel housings, C-clamps, and many other items were retrieved and decontaminated. These were then examined and sectioned or reassembled to understand better the part they played in the standing of the hot cell in laboratory analysis work. The components are scram shock spring and housing, shield plug body, guide tube, 
rack, extension rod, connecting rod, and the control rod blades which regulated the power output of the reactor core. Particular interest focused on the central control rod drive assembly. It was carefully dissected and examined for telltale evidence. As found, the central control rod appeared only slightly withdrawn. However, upon matching impact marks and scratches on the inside of the rod guide tube with those on the extension rod, it was revealed that the central control rod might have been almost entirely withdrawn at the time of the reactor excursion. Shield plugs for the outer control rods also underwent close scrutiny. This showed that an exceptionally high pressure had developed at the underside of the vessel head during the excursion. The magnitude of the high pressure was reflected in pronounced pinching and distortion of the extension tubes. Also in collision damage to the spring housings and flanges. But the itself continued to be the main focus of attention. Examination of the vessel internals could now proceed by direct means. This would not have been possible, but for the partial shielding afforded by the cask. Technicians were able to look through the existing steam outlet hole with a boroscope into the vessel interior. The boroscoping revealed that all internal head connections were severed and head removal could proceed. Bulging of the vessel wall had caused the stud bolts on the flange to exert an inward pinching force on the head, making its removal difficult. The task was accomplished by driving wedges between the head and vessel flange with a crude, though effective, pendulum hammer. An unobstructed direct view of the vessel interior was now possible with the aid of a mirror and direct photography. The central control rod blade, locked in its shroud, could be seen lying on top of the damaged core. Removal of the central blade and shroud laid bare the true extent of damage to the reactor. The core was radially expanded and wedged against the thermal shield. Feed water spray rings were collapsed. The 16 element central region experienced severe melting, mechanical distortion, and complete disarrangement. A number of flux wires inserted just prior to the accident were also visible. The 24 element outer sections were squeezed between the disfigured cruciform shrouds and the thermal shield. Traces of solidified boric oxide could be seen as white streaks on the inside wall of the reactor vessel. Later, more detailed examination revealed a post-incident water level mark on the shrouds at approximately the same height as the top of the fuel elements. Core examination was augmented by boring eight two-inch holes around the perimeter of the vessel below the bottom of the core and thermal shield. Through these holes, photographers obtained pictures of the entire bottom structure of the core and debris lying on the bottom of the vessel. The bulged vessel was then lifted from the cask and inserted into a holding fixture. Next, an eight-inch hole was bored through the bottom of the vessel. The drill bit cut through the three-quarter inch steel like a big cookie cutter. This allowed a large section of debris from the bottom of the vessel to be removed and examined. It was intended to recover the debris undisturbed to study material thought to be in sedimentary layers. However, during the sample removal operation, the plug was upset, thereby destroying any evidence that might have been gained from possible sedimentation. While the remaining debris was being scraped out, a TV camera with a monitoring screen in the gallery was positioned outside one of the two-inch holes in order to observe and direct the cleaning operation. Next, a critical experiment was conducted as an aid in determining the shutdown mechanism and to assess the possibility that multiple excursions had occurred. A specially adapted framework was placed in the hot shop to accommodate the experiment. The vessel was suspended by its flange into an aluminum tank deep enough to envelop the core area. Water could then be introduced into the vessel under controlled conditions through the eight inch hole in the vessel bottom. It was conjectured that the addition of water to the water level ring found at the top of the core 
might add enough moderating medium to achieve criticality. Five times the vessel was filled to six inches above the core without achieving criticality. Three of the filling operations used diluted acetic acid for washing boric acid from the fuel region. The last of these fillings was heated to 160 degrees Fahrenheit to speed the dissolving process. Samples of the dump water were obtained to analyze the effectiveness of boron removal. All but a trace of boric acid was washed from the fuel plates. The final filling was performed with demineralized water, and as in previous fillings, very little neutron multiplication was observed. It was evident that the core was left greatly subcritical as a result of the accident. The effective multiplication factor was about six tenths, which is considerably below unity, the amount necessary for a self-sustaining chain reaction. The experiment was then terminated and preparations for disassembly commenced. Dissection of the vessel and core started with horizontal cutting of the vessel just below the top of the thermal shield. vessel exposed the upper parts of the control rod shrouds. Manipulator access to the core was now greatly improved. The loose fuel plates, fuel elements, the core support structure and shrouds came out with little difficulty. The radial force of the excursion was apparent in the concave appearance of the outer control rod shroud. All core parts were set aside in trays for analysis in the radioactive materials laboratory. Lastly, the thermal shield was extracted and the pressure vessel bottom completely vacuum cleaned. Central rod and shroud examination obviously took preference over other core components. The blade was observed to be bound in its shroud at a withdrawal distance of 20 inches. That the central blade did not slip within its shroud after the excursion was proven by the matching impact prints of the shroud circulation holes on the blade surface. Also by fuel residue splattered on the shroud and through the holes on the corresponding areas of the blade. Matching longitudinal rub marks found on the shroud and blade cladding were interrupted by oxide flaking or impact marks from the shroud weep holes thus indicating these rub marks were of pre-incident origin. The blade was cut in sections to provide chemical and metallurgical specimens for examination by SL-1 recovery personnel and requesting organizations. Gross accountability of fuel and burnable boron strips was undertaken by examining each element and plate, recording its identification number, approximating the amount of fuel or boron remaining, and mapping the results. From this it was deduced that the severest core damage was around the central control blade, decreasing radially outward. Approximately 50% of the center 16 elements had completely melted or otherwise failed. Flux wires running through the middle of these melted elements were relatively undamaged, however. Despite the high rate of fuel melting, cladding rupture, and the spewing of melted fuel, the immediate transfer of heat to the water left the adjacent aluminum cobalt flux fires unmelted. The remaining boron strips were gray in color, obviously brittle, and easily broken by hand manipulators. Approximately 92% of the fuel originally within the core was recovered from inside the reactor vessel. The remainder escaped from the vessel at the time of the accident. Fission product release was about 5%, which is not in complete agreement with the observed loss of fuel. Debris from the bottom of the vessel was sifted according to mesh size. Laboratory analysis revealed the major constituents to be uranium, aluminum, boron, iron, and indissolvable oxides. Close examination of the outer control rod blades revealed no movement from their relative rest positions in the core during the time of the accident. The undercore support structure was badly bent and twisted. Experts were called upon to examine the core for telltale signs 
of a chemical explosion. They found none. Representative boron strips, fuel plates, control rods, core structure, vessel walls, and thermal shield were sectioned for radiochemical, metallurgical, and physical examination and testing. The recovered aluminum cobalt flux wires, having no radiation history prior to the accident, served as excellent monitors for determining neutron flux profile and energy expended during the accident. The flux wire was of aluminum stock with tiny slugs containing cobalt in the shank every three inches. Meticulous care was exercised to decontaminate the wires, weigh, and dissolve the slugs, and count the specimens on a 256 channel analyzer. Then by appropriately applying mathematical conversions, the flux numbers were obtained. After decontamination of the vessel head, shield plugs, and the center section of the reactor room ceiling, all items were reassembled in their original orientation for further studies to verify trajectories of the plugs and damage to the ceiling. Previously gathered evidence indicated that on the night of the accident, the three-man crew was in the process of connecting the control blades to the drive mechanism when the excursion occurred. Now, this is the routine procedure they were believed to be following. First, the shield plug is slipped down over the rack. The pinion gear housing and spring housing follow. The pinion gear is inserted in place. The lifting tool is then inserted into the spring housing and threaded onto the rack. The rack is then lifted a few inches out of the housing to place the C-clamp on the rack. The handling tool is lowered until the C-clamp rests on the spring housing, thus holding the assembly in place. The handling tool is removed and the retaining washer and nut are placed on the rack. The handling tool is screwed back on the rack. The handling tool and attachments are lifted to remove the C-clamp. It was near this point in assembly that the excursion occurred. Physical evidence shows that the nut, washer, and handling tool were on the central control rod at the time of the accident. The evidence was consistent with the possibility of hand withdrawal of the 85-pound central control rod blade to the 20-inch position. To test empirically that this is possible, a control rod drive mechanism was assembled over a pool of water and attempts were made to withdraw the rod with reasonable efforts and maximum efforts. Similar tests simulating stuck mechanism conditions were also conducted. All data were recorded on an oscilloscope. It was concluded from analyzing the data that an average man could withdraw the blade fast enough and far enough to reach the observed 20-inch final position before steam generation terminated the power excursion. The experiment further showed that a 20-inch withdrawal would not likely result from trying to free a frozen rod assembly. The animated scenes that follow depict the complex sequence of events that are believed to have occurred during the accident. It is important to remember that the whole sequence probably took place in less than four seconds. Direct cause of the accident clearly appears to have been manual withdrawal of the central control rod blade by one or more of the crew members considerably beyond the limits specified in maintenance procedure. However, there was insufficient evidence to establish the actual reason for such abnormal withdrawal. Now in slower motion. Regardless of the withdrawal mechanism, 
the central control blade was lifted approximately 20 inches. This was three to four inches above its critical position of 16 to 17 inches. Approximately a 2% supercritical condition resulted, corresponding to a period of about four milliseconds. This supercritical configuration caused the rapid production of neutrons by fission for a total energy release of approximately 130 megawatt seconds. A metal water reaction probably contributed 20 MWS additional energy release. The fissions occurring within the fuel plates increased the temperature of these plates to a point near or above melting, depending upon location in the core. In the center regions of maximum neutron flux, the fuel within the plates experienced vaporization temperatures and burst the plate cladding. Thus, the spewing of hot vaporized fuel rapidly produced steam in the surrounding water. The steam was generated at a rate far faster than could be dissipated, and the resulting outward expansion of this high-pressure steam bubble of at least 500 PSI damaged the core. The central blade was seized by the shroud surrounding it, and the two became an integral unit. At this time of seizure, the central blade was withdrawn about 20 inches. The steam being generated pushed upon the water that was above the level of the core, forcing the slug of water upward from the core zone. It was stopped by the vessel head, with a resultant water hammer causing peak pressures of about 10,000 PSI. While the water was moving upward, the core structure jumped, reaching a height of seven inches above its supports when the water hammer hit the head. As the water was decelerated upon striking the vessel head, the forces generated collapsed the shield plug guide tubes. It also deformed the vessel wall and the vessel head nozzles. Additionally, the momentum of this water, as it struck the vessel head, transferred its energy to the reactor vessel, imparting a vertical motion to the shield plugs and to the vessel itself. Some biological shielding material was ejected from its container on the vessel head. The vessel jumped approximately nine feet, sharing the connecting pipes and expelling some of the surrounding thermal insulation. Simultaneously with the vessel lift, the pressure within the vessel expelled the unbolted shield plugs. The ejected shield plugs came to rest in various locations. Number four in the fan duct, number three on the fan floor, number one and number seven in the operating room ceiling. The central plug hit the ceiling and fell back on the vessel head as the vessel dropped back to its original position. Reconstruction of the movement of the central mechanism gives greater insight into the physical damage observed on the rod. Initially, the rod was withdrawn approximately 20 inches. As a result of the core jumping during excursion, the central rod was moved upward an additional seven inches. The water hammer pressure then bound the rod and tube together at this relative position of 27 inches. The plug and rod were accelerated as a unit from the nozzle by the high pressure. Upon hitting the ceiling, the handling tool snapped the threaded end of the rack, impaling the tool into the ceiling. The impact also broke the rack inside the plug and simultaneously caused the plug to slip back up the rod to the fully inserted position. The plug flange then hit the overhead structure and the fractured rack continued into the fan room. The plug fell back onto the vessel head, snapping the connecting rod after it had been driven upward through the plug about three inches. The scratch mark evidence and matching marks on the tube and extension explain the seeming discrepancy of finding the central shield plug with the final rod withdrawal position only three inches above the normal zero position. The accident unfortunately terminated more than two years of successful SL-1 operation, during which valuable nuclear technology was gained. At the same time, lessons learned from the accident itself must be fully exploited for the betterment of atomic industry as a whole. Recognizing that 
future nuclear incidents, if any, will differ in degree and complexity, the SL-1 experience has emphasized several considerations. Extensive and detailed emergency pre-planning is a necessity for any reactor site if personnel are to be protected.